now it should work. Okay. So being a clinician and being used to teaching medical students and residents, we typically will start off with a case scenario. And actually, I see a lot of graduate students who come from BU Student Health down to see me for an abnormal pap test. So we have a 29-year-old female grad student, and she's referred to a gynecologist for an abnormal pap test. So I was actually going to start off with real basics, um, and that is, what is a pap test? And I suspect everyone here has heard of it. I assume that all of the women have had one, but do they really have any idea what it's about? And so I'm actually starting with real, real basics, um, female, and this is the uterus. This part of the uterus is called the cervix, and this is the vagina. And so you can see up there, and you can get cancer of the cervix. You can get a very different cancer of the uterus. The cancers of the uterus are actually totally different histologically, um, total different risk factors. They are totally different cancers, and I am not discussing them today. We are only talking about cancers of this little area here, which is called cancers of the cervix. This is actually annoying me. Let me try it. Let's see if this does any better on this side. Is that better? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, in any case, this is showing normal cervix vagina going towards cancer. This is looking at the cervix head on. So when we do a speculum exam, um, which I'll show here, which is how a pap test is done, we have a woman, typically you will lie on your back, put your feet in these things called stirrups, um, which are sometimes covered with potholders or something so that your feet don't get cold. You put in this thing called a speculum, and if someone could come up with another way of doing these tests, I think people would be very happy. Um, in any case, we use it, this time we're using this thing called a broom, which is taking basically just a scraping of cells, very superficial specimen, taking a number of cells, and what used to be done is that we used to actually take those cells and put them on a glass slide and then put fixative or hairspray onto them, and then that slide would go to the cytopathologist to be read. Nowadays, we use what we call liquid, um, liquid medium, and I've put both of the ones that are at least are available in this country, um, and they have different advantages and disadvantages, and I'm not about to go into that now. But in any case, the specimens are taken the same way. One of them is called thin prep, one of them is called sure path. Um, and that specimen then is basically spun down, and at the side of pathologist's office, they have this whole thing for then making a slide and then looking at the slide. And they get much prettier, better looking slides with the liquid medium than they did with the conventional slides. Although, in fact, the studies have not necessarily shown that one is better than the other. Um, this is what the pap tests look like. This is what the cytopathologists are looking at. And typically, the techs will look at these cells, and they have, there are actually now rules guiding how many fields they need to look at, how many slides they can view in an hour, what's the maximum number of slides per day. Um, because as you can see, it's very laborious, and sometimes the abnormal cells, the ones that get people upset, which are really in this, obviously, cancer, and these so-called high-grade squamous intraepithelial lesions, they may only have a few cells out of hundreds, thousands of cells on the slide that the cytopathologist has to find and call as being the abnormal cells. So um, it's a non-trivial, very... Um, very technician-dependent process. And so we do these tests, and then we have, well, what do we do for an abnormal pap test? Why was this 29-year-old grad student sent to see me? And what we do is something called a colposcopy. And a colposcopy uses this device, which is basically a microscope on wheels. It um, uses fairly low magnification. We put um, again, the patient is in what we call a lithotomy position on their backs with their legs up. And we put a speculum in so that we can see the cervix, normal cervix, spreading cancer, which we're hoping our 29-year-old doesn't have and in all likelihood she does not have. And when we look at the colposcope, we actually see the cervix and we see certain types of changes typically after we put white vinegar or 5% acetic acid on the cervix.
Why they came up with this, it was actually unfortunately developed in the, by the Nazis in the 30s, much as I hate to say it. Um, but it does seem to actually work for identifying abnormal areas. And just to give an example of what a colposcopy looks like, so this metal thing around here is a speculum. And actually, that's the cervix. And uh, this would be the opening of the cervix. And I don't know how well it projects, but you can see there's sort of a white area anteriorly. Um, so basically, this is the opening. This would be what we call glandular epithelium, which is lining the cervix. This is the sc smooth squamous epithelium. Lesion, cervical cancer tends to develop at the junction of these two cell types. And this would be a, terp a typical type of lesion that we could see on colposcopy. And this is high magnification, same patient, same lesion. Um, when we take a biopsy, so this is just to look at, this is what squamous epithelium looks like. So if you take a biopsy of your skin, it actually looks similar to this, but then on top you see these long pink strips, which is actually the keratin or the stuff that keeps your skin waterproof. Um, on what we call mucosal sur surfaces or non-hair-bearing areas, such as the cervix, we don't have that, but we see a differentiation of sort of larger cells going to smaller cells um, as they go up. And this line here, is what we call the basement membrane. It's basically between the epithelium and the underlying tissue. Um, as we go through, so this is normal, mildly abnormal, moderately abnormal, or cervical intraepithelial neoplasia, grades one, two, and three. And you can see by the time you get grade three, you're getting these abnormal cells that are going full thickness. But the fact that they're not going through the basement membrane keeps it from being cancer. So she had a biopsy done, small piece of tissue. We take, say, it's about a two to three millimeter size specimen. And the recommended treatment procedure is something that we either excision. So we gynecologists, like most surgeons there, tend to be kind of brute force, although we're going to be less brute force as we progress. So you either burn it, you see you either burn it, freeze it, or cut it out. <laughs> and so, in this case, what we most commonly do these days is a procedure that's done in the office um, called a loop electrosurgical excision procedure. And it's a procedure where we basically are cutting out the specimen um, and cauterizing the edges. And you can see it really looks like we've removed actually a sizable chunk of the cervix. When I see this patient in six weeks, her cervix will look almost normal again, which is actually kind of very impressive how the cervix will regenerate itself. And what's wonderful about this procedure is that the cure rate is very high and she'll be followed with pap tests. Um, the current recommendations are annually for the next 20 years. I did not go into pap smear screening recommendations here because that's like an entire lecture in of itself. Um, but the bottom line is, is that she's pretty much been cured and the likelihood that she will develop cancer is very small. Had she not had this procedure done, she would have a 30% chance of developing cancer, although the timing for when she would develop that cancer can be over 10 or more years. So what does the pap smear do, or the pap test? It finds pre-invasive disease. We're truly finding disease that is not cancer. It's different from a mammogram, which is finding early cancers. Here we are finding non-cancers. Um, and you also can find early cancers, and because they're early, they do have much better prognosis. And just to give a sense as to sort of the effectiveness of pap smears, and this was not done in the era of um, data-driven evidence, this was just Basically, the pap test was developed as a mistake when they were trying to do something else in the 30s, 20s, 30s, and slowly came into being. And basically, by the mid-60s, about 50% of women had ever had a pap test. Um, and you can see the rates of cervical cancer already going down. This is mortality rates. So this is number of people who die from cervical cancer. 
And by the mid-70s, about 80% of women have pap smear, and the rates have greatly decreased. There is still this low-level rate of um, cancers that seem to slip through, and there's a number of reasons for why they seem to slip through. Um, this type of curve has been replicated in every country that has adopted, that has a good medical infrastructure and has been able to adopt a cervical cancer screening program. So in, the, in Great Britain, where they didn't start doing routine pap tests until the mid to late 80s, this whole thing has shifted over. Um, but it's very impressive. However, as I said, it's not completely effective. It is not a very sensitive test. And because it's not very sensitive, it requires multiple iterations in hopes of catching an abnormality. Um, and the majority of cancers that we currently find are from women who have been inadequately screened. And that's not missing a pap test last year. These are women who have never been screened. Here at Boston Medical Center, they're largely immigrants. Um, and women who come from Haiti, they have never had a pap test before in their life, and they get their first pap test, and they have severe dysplasia, and then are diagnosed with cancer. Um, so those are some of the reasons. So what causes cervical cancer? Everyone should know this now. HPV, thank you. So before about 1999-2000, we did not know that HPV caused cervical cancer. And I say that because I gave a lecture in 2000 to a group of gynecologic oncologists, and they didn't believe that HPV caused cervical cancer at that point. So I'm just saying things have come a long way in 12 years. Um, so we know that HPV causes cervical cancer. This was the huge study that was done um, where they took 1,000 cervical cancer specimens from around the world, talked about the importance of specimen banking, and basically found HPV DNA in all of the specimens. Um, the biggest players are HPV 16 and 18. Um, what is HPV? It's a non-envelope, double-stranded DNA. I am not a molecular biologist. I, understand this only a bit, but basically DNA is a very simple, has a very simple genome, and there are the early genes and the late genes. The most important ones here are E6 and E7, which seem to be the ones that go awry in cancers, and the ones that are important actually for making the vaccine, um, which has been so incredibly successful, even though people really had no idea that it was going to work, is L1 and L2, which actually form that little, sort of that capsid, the capsid coat on the outside, which is a strange little coat. And so when you get an HPV infection, the HPV infection actually has to go through to the bottom layer of cells, you know, that layer of cells that I'd shown you that's right above the basement membrane. So we think it gets there through what we call microabrasions, very thin breaks in the, in the, in the cervix. And essentially, it will infect what we call a basal keratinocyte. And then essentially, it borrows the um, cell replication equipment from the, um, from the squamous cells and until it basically makes it all the way to the top when it's ready to be distributed to the, to the world where someone is HPV positive and, um, and can then infect someone else. And so this is somewhat of a schematic for what we think happens with these HPV infections. So this is our little HPV infection. Um, HPV infections are very common, and most HPV infections will, well, we, at least we believe that they clear on their own. And upwards of 90% of them will clear on their own. Um, some of them will stay around for a period longer six to 24 months, and they may then develop this, these so-called precancerous lesions or high-grade lesions. Those, if untreated, over an average of 10 years can develop into invasive cancer. Um, however, even these high-grade lesions can still clear. 
And so these high-grade lesions have about a 30% chance of going back to being normal, 30% chance of being cancer, and then 30, 40% chance of just staying the same. And this is, as far as understanding HPV and cervical cancer, this is probably the most important graph to think about in that um, this is prevalence versus age. And HPV infections are most commonly diagnosed in young women um, with at sort of early, in their early sexual life, so to speak. Um, so basically the peak HPV prevalence is probably in the early 20s. And then you can see though that the precancers, the CIN2 to 3s, really the peak age for those is in the late 20s, early 30s, like our 29-year-old grad student. And then lastly, the cancers start becoming a problem in the early 40s. And this is one of the problems, especially in, say, sub-Saharan Africa, where the, between HIV and cancer, um, product, you know, very active, productive women are basically being killed off by a combination of the two. So what we need is persistence of the HPV. Um, to get cervical cancer. And this is again just showing, this is just showing HPV prevalence, which as you can see drops way down in the 30s, and cervical cancer rates start decreasing, uh, start increasing as HPV rates decrease. And so we think it's the, um, that those persistent HPVs, and only a small percentage of persistent HPV will go on to develop cancer, and again, we don't know why some people clear HPV, other people don't, why some people when it persists it doesn't do anything, and other people when it persists it will cause cancer. So what's been interesting, and people have been trying to address the poor sensitivity of the PAP test for the detection um, of cervical cancer and cervical cancer precursors. And as we can see, you have to have HPV in order to find cervical cancer. So in the mid to late 90s, actually 1997, um, a test called Hybrid Capture 2, which detects infection with a whole group of HPV types. It does not tell you which one, but it tells you a whole group. Um, but it can differentiate between those who are HPV positive and those who are HPV negative. And this was somewhat of a milestone, although people were not necessarily sure exactly what to do with it. Um, and in young women, as you can imagine, you get a whole lot of false positives because most of those women will clear their HPV infections. And so there have been a huge number of studies looking at HPV testing versus PAP testing for the detection of, we use CIN2, plus as being the precursors for cervical cancer. And basically, with the PAP test, the cutoff will actually be a high-grade PAP test. So it, it gets to be somewhat tricky, but the bottom line is, is that the sensitivity is much better. Some studies will actually put it much higher than 83% even. Um, but the specificity is much poorer, and the positive predictive value is much poorer. And so, um, so that sort of gives some of the feel of the problems with HPV testing versus the PAP test. And so to improve the specificity of HPV detection, there have actually been a number of new tests that have arrived on the block. Some are FDA approved, some are just in development. Um, one which is FDA approved is a test that's similar to the one that I mentioned where they look for in this case, 14 different high-risk HPV strains, but then what they can do is they can actually then take the specimens that test positive and test for HPV type 16 and 18. And if it tests positive for 16 or 18, then that's a much, that actually has a much worse prognosis than people who do not have HPV 16 or 18. And so that's, um, and it, so it actually does a very effective job of triaging. I do not know how expensive the test is. We do not have it available here at Boston Medical Center. Um, there's also another test which is done 
actually from the same people who do the majority of the STD tests. So when we do a test for gonorrhea and chlamydia, we use something from GenProbe. And they have another test for, um, in this case, they're looking at the messenger RNA for E6 and E7. So the thought is here that they're going to find not actually whether there's HPV there or not, but whether the HPV is actually doing something. Is it active HPV? Is it what we think is probably persistent or more meaningful HPV? Um, and then there's another test, which I believe is still just in development, where they are actually looking for E6 and E7. And it's only if they find E6 and E7 expressed will they actually call that person HPV positive in the thought that it's, as I say, catching those persistent HPV infections rather than the transient ones. So now we're going to move on to a slightly different end because the true prevention is the prevention of HPV. And so rather than finding it when it's there, um, in the 2000s, in the noughts, whatever you want to call them, um, the HPV vaccines have been um, FDA approved. And there are two different HPV vaccines. As you can see, the, it basically looks very similar to what HPV looks like. Um, the difference is, is that there's no genetic material inside of it. So it's like an empty shell. And it's fascinating that they were able to get this to work. They have, there are different types of these for the different HPV types. So there's a quadrivalent vaccine which protects against types both of, both of the, two, the two vaccines on the market both protect against types 16 and 18, which are responsible for about 70% of cervical cancers. And then there's also um, the quadrivalent also prevents the types of cervical cancers that are associated with genital warts, and those are types 6 and 11. Um, but they're extremely effective, but they are only effective if they are given to people before they've been exposed to the HPV types that it's supposed to protect against. And that's why you're supposed to vaccinate, in this case, young girls and young boys. So um, kids, the ideal age is 11 to 12 year olds, so before the onset of sexual activity. Um, so as I say, both, both of the vaccines have been shown to prevent persistent infections, and high-grade dysplasias. We don't know yet how well it will work around um, as far as preventing cancer because cancers happen at a later point in time. We don't have that um, time frame yet. So now I'm going to switch places a little bit more and talk about some of the problems about cervical cancer around the world. It is the third most commonly diagnosed cancer. And it is the fourth leading cause of cancer deaths in females. This is around the world. Um, and greater than 85% of the cases and the deaths occur in developing countries. So this has become a disease of countries that do not have a cervical cancer screening program. And it should be noted that in the US before 1955, it was the leading cause of cancer death here. So, um, and just to look, basically red is bad, green is good, <laughs> and you can see it's sort of Central South America and Sub-Saharan Africa, as well as India and some areas around Malaysia and Indonesia. And again, it's just a slightly different way of looking at it, but if you take sort of a cutoff point being around here, this is basically where there are at least some type of screening programs and where there are no screening programs, and incidence of mortality. So in the US, and I showed this to you before, um, basically we have three different ways of preventing cervical cancer. We have, you can get vaccinated, then you would get pap test. We've now delayed the start of pap test to age 21, so you would start the pap testing here, and then starting around age 30, you can actually add an HPV test to the pap test to increase the sensitivity. And we start the HPV testing in the 30s because as you can see, the prevalence of HPV is significantly lower in the 30s than it is in the 20s. Not sure why this is blank. Oh. 
So cervical cancer is pretty much completely preventable, except for a few escape cases. Um, and so, as I say, all of this is well and good, but the problems with pap tests and the problems with HPV testing is that they're relatively expensive and they require a complex infrastructure. Pap testing needs to, basically you need to make a slide, the slide has to make it to a lab, the lab has to be able to develop the slide, read it, have cytotechnologists read it, and then get the information back to the patients. Um, it's a multi-step process. HPV testing is much the same. And as a result, patients are lost to follow-up. In a lot of the world, patients still live in areas that do not have electricity, do not have running water, do not have easy access to anything. And so to try to address this, um, a more simple technology has been developed called direct visual, visual inspection or visual inspection with acetic acid. And this is typically done by sort of nurses, um, what we call sort of low-level uh, medical providers, um, and has been tried in much of the developing world in different, different areas where they've been able to um, pilot it, essentially. And it basically, you use a speculum. Um, so you do need a speculum, clean speculum. Um, you then have the cervix, you put some white vinegar on it, and use a flashlight and see if you see anything abnormal. And if you see what we call acetowhitening, that's considered a positive test, and then you would further treat the patient depending on what is available to you. Another idea is using um, visual inspection with iodine. It's just another dye that you can use. Some people consider this to be more sensitive, others not. Um, but it does much the same thing. And these are ones that were, in this case, um, suspicious for cancer. So strengths, it's a relatively low false negative rate. It is inexpensive. Um, people can be fairly readily trained for it. Um, and if it's combined with immediate treatment, and the immediate treatment that most people would use would be something we call cryotherapy. Um, we talked about, I talked about the different ways that we treat things, and this is the brute force way with just freezing the cervix. Uh, but it's a very easy thing to do in that you just have a, you need a can of liquid nitrogen, and basically you have a special adapter that you put on the cervix, and you essentially make a freeze ball of the cervix. Limitations, over-treatment, under-treatment, um, and it's also not very accurate upon, with menopausal women, which are, of course, women who are majorly at risk. Now, I bring, this is actually one of the most phenomenal studies that I think has been done in the last 10 years. Um, there's a study that was done in rural India with um, over 100,000 women who had never been previously screened. I think under 20 of these women had ever had a pap test before. So, and what they did was to divide what um, and I'm sorry, I cannot pronounce the author's name. Um, but what he did was to divide the area that was being studied into four districts. And looked at the four districts. Basically, each of them was subjected to a different type of testing. One group had a one-time HPV test. One group had a one-time PAP test. One-time visual inspection with acetic acid. And then control, meaning they had no screening whatsoever. Um, and, and I should note that this guy basically had been very much promoting visual inspection with acetic acid, and so his hope was that visual inspection with acetic acid would do as well as any of the other methods. Um, if they had a one-time positive screening test, they would get a colposcopy with directed biopsy, and if they had high-grade dysplasia, they were treated with either a LEAP, so an excision procedure, or with cryo, with freezing. Um, and those with cervical cancer were referred for surgery. Um, after this initial round that happened in the first year, basically the women were um, interviewed every year to see if they had developed cervical cancer or not. They weren't, they weren't examined, they were just asked, did you develop cervical cancer or no? 
as in did you have symptomatic cervical cancer. And so just to show, you know, there is very high acceptance for the screening. Um, of those who screened, um, as you can see, VIA actually had the greatest number of screening positive, um, HPV second, and um, pap test third. And of note, I believe the women were all 30 or 35 and older, and actually had to be married, which I think was supposed to be a surrogate for having been sexually active. Um, so then, basically the question was, how many of those with a positive test went on to colposcopy? And the majority did. And then, of those who had a positive test, what percentage were ultimately diagnosed with cervical dysplasia, high-grade dysplasia, and cervical cancer? And as you can see, a comparable number were diagnosed with cervical cancer, 0.3% in all groups, um, and CIN 2 to 3. Um, the HPV and the PAP tests are fairly similar with the VIA having a smaller percentage. So assuming that the groups were somewhat homogeneous, there might be something of a difference there. Um, this is the part that wound up being fascinating. They wound up stopping the study early because by year seven, they were seeing a difference in outcome that they weren't expecting to see until at least year 10 or 14. And so looking at years, and you can see the different methods here. And basically, this is the cervical cancer rate per 1,000 women. So we usually talk about rates per 100,000 women. So these rates are very high. I mean, the cervical cancer rate in this country is about four per 100,000. So um, as you can see, the control group and the HPV testing had about similar rates of cervical cancer diagnosed by year seven. Um, HPV testing had slightly higher before them, but they actually had similar rates. And the cytology and VIA um, found also higher rates of cervical cancer by year seven. However, what's different is if you look at mortality. Um, so we look at incidence and mortality, and this is looking at incidence of stage two. Stage, now cervical cancer, if it's caught at stage one, is a very treatable disease. It's treated with surgery, to, treated with surgery or radiation. Prognosis is over 90% five-year survival, which is a good prognosis. Um, stage two and above is much worse. Um, the outcomes significantly worsen. So the rate per 1,000 women, as you can see, the stage twos were significantly lower in the patients who had had HPV testing for their screening compared to all of the other ones. And correspondingly, the mortality rate for those who had had HPV testing as the initial screen were, was much lower. And, you know, and it was enough lower that they stopped the study at that point. So I bring this up because it just shows how effective HPV testing can be, especially in the screening of older women. Now, CARE HPV, oh, this is interesting. I didn't realize it was doing this. Um, the problem with HPV testing is that it's expensive and needs all kinds of special lab equipment. And um, typically, it's a test that's sent away, and then you come back and get results. Now, about a little bit less than 10 years ago, um, there's been a joint venture between Kyogen, and Kyogen are the ones who make Hybrid Capture 2, which is the major HPV screening test that is used, um, and the Gates, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And so, let me just... So they basically developed a test that is a point-of-service test. Um, so it is a test that is cheap, simple, requires minimal lab training, does not need running water or electricity, and has less than three hour turnaround time. So in a lot of ways, this is an amazing test that they've developed. It has not, is not yet commercially available. Um, and the other thing which they did with this test was because most of these studies were actually done in rural China, another area that has not been largely screened, 
and, um, and Chinese culture, probably Indian culture as well, um, they actually took self-collected self specimens in addition to provider-collected specimens. And the thought is that there are a lot of women who just don't like the idea of having a speculum in and for whatever reason would refuse to do that, but would agree to have would do a self-collection, something they can do in the privacy, um, and then hand the specimen um, to be tested. And so these are actually the results from rural China. Um, and as you can see, again, they looked at visual inspection with acetic acid, visual inspection plus Lugols, the CARE HPV, and they also did colposcopy on everyone. And this is for detection of, again, the high-grade dysplasias are higher. And as you can see, actually here, the sensitivity was not very good for VIA and VIA with blue balls. Um, and although the specificity was pretty good. Care HPV, however, was actually quite good. And colposcopy, as I say, is not 100%. It was only 80%. Um, basically 80 on both sides. So, but it's just, it's interesting. So the provider and self-test were almost the same. And, um, and in a lot of ways seem to provide a good screening test. Um, then there's the other issue of vaccination, which is something else that you think would probably be a good thing to have in the developing, in lower resource countries. Um, theoretically, vaccination could reduce cervical cancer rates by 70%. It's much easier to vaccinate kids while they're in school than it is for doing screening um, rounds. And most countries already do have vaccination programs of one sort or another. And just to give, and now we talked about 16 and 18, which is in both of the FDA approved um, cervical cancer vaccines. And what's interesting is that if you look at the cervical cancer cases around the world, um, majority, somewhere between 65 and 75 percent of them are related to HPV 1618. Um, it's impressive that it is somewhat similar around the world. And so it's thought that if ever we could get everyone vaccinated, then we could actually save people from getting cervical cancer. But there are questions. We don't know how long the immunity is. Um, getting it into screening programs and distribution is difficult. It has to be refrigerated, kept at certain temperatures, and all sorts of different things. So we have prevention strategies. If we just look at what we have, we have pap test screening, HPV testing, direct visual inspection, HPV vaccination. And did I say anything here? Oh, yes. So. Basically, cervical cancer appears to be largely a preventable disease. Um, and HPV testing is very promising, especially this point of care test. And I think that this will actually be one of the key things to taking care of, even if we were to get everyone vaccinated, all 11 to 12 year olds around the world vaccinated, there would still be the women who had not been vaccinated would still be developing cervical cancer. And so those are the women who would need to be screened. And I think the CARE HPV is an excellent way of going about that. And HPV vaccine is very promising. And so resources should be targeted towards screening and vaccination protocols and new methods of development. That's it. Okay. Okay, so we have two more talks to follow, but let's ask some questions of Dr. Steyer. Very interesting and provocative. Who has questions for Dr. Steyer? Anyone doing? None? Yes, please. You said there was a small minority that isn't caused by HPV. Is there any idea no, as to we, what's causing or is it just really random? It's somewhat random, and we, so we believe that there's HPV, so the majority of cancers, and I did not go into all of this, majority of cancers are squamous cancers. A smaller percentage are glandular cancers, but they're considered cervical cancers. The glandular cancers are much more difficult to detect. 
They still tend to be HPV associated, but the HPV tests for them are not as likely to be positive for some reason, and I'm not quite sure why. Um, and then there are some cancers that seem to develop de nouveau in a very short period of time and behave somewhat differently from the typical squamous and um, glandular cancers. And so and those are the ones that I think no matter how we try to screen for them, at least with what we currently have available, we're not going to be able to do it. What about, um, what about HPV infection altering the risk for contracting HIV from sex? That's or a, vice versa? That's a very good question. So it's not clear that there's a direct, I mean, I actually don't, completely know the answer. And I know that Deb Anderson here is actually looking into that. Um, she's looking into, she, she's a um, molecular biologist who does um, mucosal immunity work. However, if the HPV disease is more likely to have microabrasions associated with it, then patients with HPV disease are more likely to be able to contract um, HIV as well as HPV. I mean, both of the diseases are contracted with microabrasions. Mm -hmm. um, you need to break in skin largely. And, um, and in both cases that can happen. As to, um, and, but as to whether HPV increases the risk of HIV, mm -hmm. I'm actually not so sure. Mm -hmm. um, HIV increases the risk of a persistent HPV infection um, basically because the immune system that's used to get rid of HPV, although it's still not very well understood, seems to not be reconstituted even with immune reconstitution with the current antiretroviral therapies that are available. So patients who look, patient, HIV infected patients who have completely normal counts um, may still have the same risk of having prolonged HPV associated diseases, cancers, as someone who does not have the same degree of reconstitution. And is there an association between HPV and anal cancer? Oh, yes. And that, that's what actually. What is it? <laughs> <laughs> that's actually what I do the majority of my research in, is, is in anal cancer and screening for anal cancer. So anal cancer, somewhere, they say about 85 to 90% of anal cancers are associated with HPV, largely HPV type 16. and. Um, and it's getting to be increasingly problematic, especially for HIV-infected men who have sex with men, where anal cancer rates have become very, very high, much higher than cervical cancer rates prior to initiating cervical cancer screening. So. Do we have other questions for Dr. Steyer? Yes, ah, excellent. to take the vaccination, and is that because of the usual controversy associated with vaccination, or are there bad effects particularly associated with this vaccination? As far as we know, this vaccine is extremely safe, and the safety profile is, um, is actually pretty remarkable. There have been some cases of blood clots, et cetera, but no more so than in any of the other vaccines. Um, and there's some issue as to if you, if you prevent it, if you present it as a sexually transmitted disease preventing vaccine, um, there's pushback from the parents on it, that they, and it depends on the parents and sort of what their thoughts are, but their thoughts are, oh, my child would never be sexually active before marriage, and so therefore she or he does not need to have the vaccine. And so there has been pushback to that. I'm hoping that as of just a couple of months ago, the recommendations actually changed so that the HPV vaccine is now recommended for both boys and girls. And it's given the same time as other vaccines in the 11 to 12 year old range. And so I'm hoping with that, that it will be treated more like this is just a preventive vaccine to help you prevent you from getting cancer. So, yes. And when do you think that we'll have good um, data on whether the vaccine is really effective at stopping cervical cancers 
in terms of you know evidence based and probably enough time has gone by for cervical cancer probably not for another 20 to 30 years what's difficult is that most of the areas that have the vaccine also have cervical cancer screening programs and so because of that, I mean, cervical cancer rates in this country are already very low. And so the way that it will be manifested in this country, as it has been in Australia, where they've actually noted significantly decreased rates of genital warts in women in their early 20s compared to just five years ago. And, and because they had very high uptake of the vaccine, which prevents against genital warts as well as um, cervical cancer and cervical cancer precursors, um, they've already seen a population-wide change. Um, we haven't had an 80 percent, 80 plus percent uptake here. Our uptake here is on the order of 20 to 30 percent. So it's very different. Um, so that's part of why it's going to be hard to say. Um, but I would say we should stay tuned for the Australian experience. We have other yes. Thanks for your talk. Uh, it seems like uh, most of the, well, most part of the talk focus on like prevention and right. like early stage of cervical cancer. Like, could you comment a little bit about like the treatment of later sure. stages and like sure. what are the main challenges and improvement we can do? Yeah. So cervical cancer in early stage cancer, um, cervical cancer spreads by what we call direct extension. So typically it will, instead of going, getting early metastatic disease, say in distant areas, it will tend to just go directly, say it can go anteriorly into the bladder, posteriorly into the rectum, or towards what we call the, the, the side walls of the pelvis. For early stage cancer, that is cancer that is confined to the cervix of certain sizes, we treat it with surgery, with a hysterectomy, and it's a slightly different hysterectomy than we would do for a non-cancer. And as I said before, the prognosis for that is very, very good. Um, the other thing that has been done, and I did not get into this at all, one of the surgical, um, one of the surgical um, fields that's been done is actually just for women who are young women who get cervical cancer that is just confined to the cervix, there are some gynecologic oncologists who will do a procedure where they just remove the cervix and it's called a radical trachelectomy. And in that way, they can um, basically preserve fertility by leaving the uterus in place. And, um, and so that can be done for a select group of patients, and that's something that has been developed over the past 10 years. Um, as far as for more advanced cancers, they are basically treated with chemotherapy and radiation. And that has not changed appreciably for really the past 20 years. I think the chemotherapy may have changed a bit. They may have gotten a little bit more focused with the radiation, but it has not changed appreciably. And um, so that's my understanding. But as I say, it's preventable, so we work on the preventable side. I, I think Dr. Steyer's answer really highlights something that you've probably heard over the last two days, which is that every cancer challenges and interesting uh, uh, approaches. So each one of the clinicians who's spoken with you has a different vantage point. One might be more interested this time in presenting to you on some of the really advanced surgical techniques in esophageal cancer. Another might be more in presenting to you on prevention of something which is almost entirely preventable. So, you know, in a 45-minute talk, you cannot cover every single aspect um, which is why the, the questions, I, I appreciate them, I'm trying to highlight some of the larger questions here. So in fact, you know, I, we all have a story. I have a good friend who um, had a radical hysterectomy uh, when we, she, she was supposed to be getting married um, for cervical bleeding and had clear cell adenocarcinoma and actually is fine um, and has adopted children 14 years later. Um, and we all have a story like that. I mean, uh, I've seen patients with melanoma who had a uh, pneumonectomy, a 31-year-old who came in pregnant with melanoma on her flank, had a radical resection, had a pneumonectomy, had part of her liver removed, had her ovary removed, and she's got a nine-year-old. I mean, so when they showed those curves going down and the 10% who were alive with stage four melanoma, uh, you don't always want to treat to that number. 
you want to treat to the early preventable group because that is such a small number and in some ways we really don't understand those patients. Who lives longer, who doesn't? In this case, we have a well-proven uh, this microphone, uh, well-proven prevention tre treating schema. And for those of you who are interested in international medicine, this is a wonderful opportunity to have a major effect based on what we already know could be done fairly effectively. Maybe you can comment on that a little more about your international work. Um, so actually the, or the international work that we plan to do. So another um, a thought to ways of actually identify cancer um, or to identify these precancers, trying to improve on the direct visualization inspection is to um, use spectroscopy, actually simplified spectroscopy technique to try to highlight the areas that are abnormal versus normal. Um, and my thought is that that would actually probably combine with the CARE HPV test yeah. um, as a way of really determining who needs treatment and who does not need treatment. Um, However, there are a lot of problems with using the spectroscopy because it is complex equipment, and complex equipment has a lot, has to be a very simplified instrument that basically can give you a yes and no answer and gives highly reproducible results. And the difficulty with developing the instrument has been in terms of trying to develop something that actually works in this, in this context. One of the other things that we had brought up earlier was, you know, do you want to do point of care diagnostics or testing? Because some people might not be prepared to listen to, you know, the genetic abnormalities they have. In this case, where <laughs> where somebody may have traveled a long distance, diagnosis and then quick treatment during their same visit with a quick turnover, um, especially if it isn't such a terribly invasive right. procedure might be something that you can do and would be acceptable to patients. Right, and largely when these point of care tests are done for cervical cancer screening and people have looked at, can we do a one-time screening test for women? And the thought is that if you screen women at age 35 or 35 and older, so, and presumably most women have had kids by this point, some of the problems with these treatments is that they can cause problems with pregnancy in the future and so that's why between that and the high degree of disease in young women, we're trying to avoid screening younger women. But, um, but for these 35-year-olds, it's a relatively benign test and has, um, can have great effect as far as preventing cancer, because those are the patients who would have these real precancerous changes. Um, is there, a, a, is there a, a complication or risk, or what is the risk with LEAP procedures and um, future fertility issues or maintenance of pregnancy? Because the cervix keeps the baby in, right? Right. So the cervix keeps the baby in. As far as we know, there's no changes in the ability to get pregnant after any of these procedures, whether it's freezing the cervix, burning the cervix with a laser, or doing an excision procedure such as the LEAP. However, as far as retaining the pregnancy or maintaining the pregnancy, there is an increased risk of preterm delivery um, and having a baby before 37 weeks. And, and what would be more significant is having the baby before 34 weeks. And the risk is not quite doubled. So it's not 100% that you're going to do this. If the risk for preterm delivery as it is here is about 10 to 15%, the risk would go up to about 25%. So it's still one out of four, which is significant. And because of that, um, we've tried to actually to start screening at later ages. We now don't do any screening until age 21. And we're trying to sort of minimize the screening that's done before the age of when the highest risk cancers would be developed. Which actually brings me to one more question. I'm sorry to dominate this, but I think these might be important issues. This is a little outside your field of expertise, but one thing we haven't talked about at all is preservation of fertility around cancer treatment. So, uh. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, the part of it is, is let procedures that might interfere with their treatment, but um, could you make a comment or two about, um, about any experience you've had in taking care of patients and, and uh, some key points about that? Right, so as far as, it depends on the patient and 
what their diagnosis is, what their treatment's going to be, et cetera. Um, as far as maintaining fertility, what's, um, say I had a patient, a 29-year-old um, law student who was diagnosed with actually a large breast cancer. And, um, and she was going to get pre-surgical pre chemotherapy. Um, and basically, because of the effects of chemotherapy on, um, on fertility, basically because certain types of chemotherapeutic agents can essentially cause, cause the ovaries to fibrose over and basically not produce the hormones that we want them to produce and not and get rid of the eggs, um, the patient actually planned for um, embryo donation or um, um, embryo harvesting. And we do have sort of, so there are all sorts of different things and I'm not up to date on all of this, but um, basically people will try to cryopreserve or get their eggs and fertilized eggs uh, work much better than unfertilized eggs. Uh, most of the experience has been in cryopreservation of embryos and cryopreservation of oocytes is still it's becoming more common, but it still doesn't work nearly as well. Um, and so we'll oftentimes try to get a patient in for an IVF cycle, essentially, an in vitro fertilization type cycle to try to make as many eggs as possible so that they, she can preserve as many um, embryos as possible um, prior to treatment. So that's one thing that's done. There, when I was in New York, there's a, um, reproductive endocrinologist who would actually take from patients who were going to get pelvic radiation, he would remove um, part of the ovary and he planted ovarian strips into the arm, mm. which was fascinating, and, um, and was actually able to document hormonal production. I don't think it was egg bearing, but at least hormonal production from there said the patient did not go into premature menopause. But again, these are experimental type things. The other, th the other thing is to choose chemotherapeutic agents that are not as, um, that are more fertility sparing, I believe. And then the other thing that used to be done was to actually take the ovaries and try to hitch them up to an area where they would not be involved in the radiation field. But that I don't believe has actually worked as well as it could have. So yeah. I see our dean. I'm gonna ask you guys to please all stay in your seats. And uh, let's just thank Dr. Steyer for coming and talking with us. <laughs>